All right, so we're going to get started, and you will soon find out why I was playing that uh, while we were getting ready for our webinar to start. And let me exit full screen. Hope that everyone is doing well tonight. Hello. My name is Deborah Hurt. I'm the project coordinator for the Department of Black Studies 50th anniversary here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And I'd like to welcome you to the second webinar of the spring semester in our, in our year long celebration. This is not a Black History Month event. We celebrate Black history all year. Uh, in establishing Negro History Week, Carter G. Woodson not only wanted to count on the lie the misinformation that Black people had no history, but by actually presenting that history. But he also wanted to use the week as an opportunity for Black organizations to reflect on what they had achieved over the past year. Our year has been and continues to be a 50-year retrospective of this department's birth, development, growth, its obstacles and battles as the department looks to the future toward breaking new ground, stimulating new growth, fostering new ideas, and creating new forms of knowledge to advance the discipline of Black studies and to benefit the communities that are at the heart of this academic work. We honor the Omaha 54, 54 brave Black male and female UNO students who risked and were indeed arrested on November 10th, 1969, standing up or more precisely sitting in for what they believed. Their demands for UNO's administration to address racial discrimination and to recognize the cultural relevance of all of its students were supported by Omaha's Black community, which mobilized and worked together to bail out all 54 students and support them in their demands. It is because of the persistence of their persistence that the Department of Black Studies came into existence in the fall of 1971 and it is because of the continued support of Omaha's Black community that this department continues to exist. We honor you and we thank you. As a discipline that reflects upon studies and critiques the continuing effects of historical enslavement, colonization and land dispossession, we acknowledge that this university sits upon the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people for whom this city is named, the Omaha, and that of other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We stand in solidarity with you. So this evening, we're excited to bring together this panel for a discussion on the history of jazz in Omaha. For people outside of Nebraska, it may be a shock to find that not only was there a thriving jazz scene in Omaha, but that it played a role in the development of the music form that we call jazz. Joining us this evening, we have Professor Justin Payne, who is an adjunct in the Department of Black Studies here at UNO. Uh, Professor Payne earned a Bachelor of Music degree from UNO and a Master's of Music from Michigan State University. Professor, Play Professor Payne plays piano, organ, and is a vocalist. He's also a composer and writes musicals. Dr. Jesse Otto, Dr. Otto earned a Bachelor of Arts in History, Social Science, and Secondary Education from Dana College, a Master of Arts in History from UNO, a Graduate Certificate in Museum Studies, and another Graduate Certificate in His Historic Preservation from the University of Hawaii. And in 2021, just a few months ago, he completed his PhD in American Studies from the University of Hawaii. Dr. Otto plays piano and keyboard, He's also a vocalist and composer and performs in the pop band Shelter Belt. And we also have Professor Preston Love Jr. Professor Love is also a, an adjunct professor here in the Department of Black Studies. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in economics from the University of Nebraska and a master's in professional studies from Bellevue University. While extremely talented, Professor Love will tell you that musicianship is not one of his talents. <laughs> After a corporate career as an executive at IBM for nearly 15 years, 
Professor Love moved into political and community organizing, blessing the Omaha community with his true talent. So I'd like to thank all three of you for being with us this evening. So as we get started, and I need to make you all full screen so that I can see, um, we want to talk about uh, some of the key figures early on in um, the history of jazz in Omaha. And, and I guess first we should start out by asking or talking about, you know, what it is that we consider to be jazz. You know, uh, Professor Love, you, you made a comment when we were having our meeting about uh, what musicians would say about jazz. You wanna share that with us? Well, I surely do. And I surely want to uh, alter my uh, unesteemed resume by <laughs> saying that you failed to say what I play. And what I play is a very mean CD. <laughs> so with that said, uh, I, we were rehearsing, if you will, but having fun. And, but there, something I learned from my dad as a young kid, I have really come to this conversation as having got a PhD before I was 15 years old by just waking up every day and listening to my dad talk about his experience in music uh, and his insight into what it all meant. So much of what I have to say, I can't take credit just uh, talking about what my dad taught me as a kid. But one of the things that uh, we had a conversation uh, when I was fully an adult and I was liking my jazz. I was liking uh, uh, Cannonball Adderley, and I was liking uh, uh, the flute player, I can't think of his name right now, he was a Herbie Mann and uh, Jimmy Smith on the organ. And my dad said, yeah, I, I appreciate you liking jazz, but let me tell you something about the word jazz, which then responds to your question. And that is that, uh, in the early days, in, well, not the, the early days, but in the 40s and 50s, uh, the black musicians, uh, the big guys who played in the big bands, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, and all the rest, they considered jazz a term of not unendearment. It was a poke fun. If a guy played jazz, he could not play. That was it. So he was, and they say, oh, he plays jazz. And then they go to laughing. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, they would say it publicly uh, because some of the listeners would think they would be, and players thought they were being complimented when they, <laughs> but they were trying to pull fun of them that they really didn't have soul, didn't have, you know, that thing that the black musicians really have, they were playing jazz. It was a derogatory term. Yeah, so I, I think that when we, when we talk about jazz, one thing that we kind of fail to realize when we don't go back very far is that what becomes known as jazz is a melding of various musical forms. And so when we talk about what we see happening here in Omaha, we're gonna see that there was this, uh, Omaha was like this kind of center where all of these different traditions were coming together and people were playing around with them and you know, combining them in different kinds of ways and creating new sounds and new, new, uh, you know, new riffs that eventually becomes jazz. But when we look at the roots, we can't say that, you know, this is jazz. This is, this is a, 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 the roots of what becomes jazz. So that's what we're gonna be really looking at today. Um, so I'm going to share a few slides while we're doing this. Um, let's see. Okay. 
And so we're gonna really kind of start laying the foundation with some, some really uh, traditional musical people, but they're the people that really laid the groundwork for what becomes jazz here in Omaha. Um, so, and I'm gonna pull a lot of this is coming from, from, um, from Jesse's MA thesis. Jesse wrote a phenomenal thesis on um, the black orchestral movement here in Omaha. And it really lays that critical foundation for what evolves and develops into jazz. And so one of those really uh, key figures in this early movement is Daniel Nestoon. So um, Jesse, can you give us a little a little history of who he was? He was this this man was phenomenal on various levels, not just musically, but just um, he was a ph phenomenal figure. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, when I started going into this research, I um, this this was a name that was coming up all the time, and uh, very little uh, had been written about him when I started looking into this and he, he struck me as the more I learned about him as somebody that I, I think he should be in American history textbooks. I think high school and uh, college freshmen, you know, ought to be learning about him. Um, so he was born in, um, in New Orleans in uh, 1873 to um, an upper middle class family. Um, and his father um, is quite famous. Uh, his father's Rodolphe Lucien Desdune. And he was a journalist, uh, historian, and a, and a civil rights activist. Um, so um, Daniel became a musician. Um, but in, uh, in 1890, um, the Louisiana uh, legislature enacted the Separate Car Act. Um, and this required railway companies to have separate cars for uh, black and white passengers. Uh, this prompted uh, Rodolphe Lucien Desdune and some of his friends to form uh, the Citizens Committee. Um, and the Citizens Committee uh, was uh, formed to fight segregation. Um, so they decided to challenge the Separate Car Act. And uh, in 1892, uh, Daniel Desdune volunteered to be part of this. So they put him on a train um, from New Orleans to Mobile, Alabama. And uh, they, they did this because they knew uh, he could pass for white and he could get into the white car. Um, and then the Citizens Committee actually hired private detectives to arrest Daniel. Um, they wanted him arrested so they could challenge it in court. Um, so he was arrested, promptly released. They challenged it in court and they won. Um, the, the courts ruled that only the federal government could regulate interstate commerce. Then they decided to attack it on an interest, intrastate level. So um, Homer Plessy was then put on a train for Baton Rouge. Uh, they hired detectives to arrest him. And this went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. So in 1896, that's when um, the infamous separate but equal ruling came from the United States Supreme Court. That uh, in the words of uh, Rodolphe Lucien Desdune wrote that this defeat was devastating. And he wrote, quote, our defeat sanctioned the odious principle of the segregation of the races, end quote. Um, but Daniel Desdune uh, did play a central role in this major event in civil rights history. Um, but yeah, he was uh, also a musician and uh, he led the Cousteau Desdune Orchestra in New Orleans. And uh, according to uh, George Philly, who was a trombone player active in New Orleans in the 1890s, uh, in an interview, he said that the Desdune Cousteau Orchestra, uh, quote, played jazz. Uh, they would always swing the music. That was their novelty. Uh, so this is really important because, um, as, as Deborah mentioned, uh, jazz developed um, in various places, what we think of as jazz today, um, but developed in various places by many, many people. Uh, but there is a, uh, a lone innovator myth. Um, and that myth holds that uh, Buddy Bolden, New Orleans cornetist, created jazz in 1905. Um, so he was an important musician, but he didn't single-handedly create it. But that year, 1905, is important because that's kind of when people see this music coming about. Um, but George Philly places Dan Desdune as playing this, this style of music and, and swinging the music uh, 13 years earlier. So. Um, not saying that Daniel Desdune created jazz, but he was 
um, almost certainly one of the first people on this planet to play the style of music that we think of today as jazz. Um, so Des Dune arrived in Omaha in 1904 then. Uh, he was a playwright. He was traveling with a troupe of actors that um, were performing a play he wrote. And he liked Omaha, recognized it as a, a, a recognized there was, there was opportunity here for him. Um, so he ended up uh, taking over a band called the Omaha Military Band. Um, and that, yep, there's the band. Um, and they became very popular very quickly after he took over uh, the leadership of the band. Uh, they later became known as the First Regimental Orchestra and then uh, eventually is the Dan Des Dune Band. Um, and uh, they, uh, uh, they were in incredibly popular, not only in Omaha, um, but the Omaha Chamber of Commerce uh, hired the band uh, to go on goodwill tours and, and apparently paid them quite well. So they would send them to communities throughout the region to, uh, to perform. And the idea was that this would encourage people to do business in Omaha. Um, so their notoriety spread beyond Omaha. Um, but the other really, really important thing that Des Dune was involved in, um, he became friends with uh, Father Edward Flanagan. Um, and uh, this, uh, even though he was from New Orleans, uh, Daniel Des Dune was Episcopalian, not Catholic. Uh, his friendship with Flanagan uh, seems to have formed around the fact that Father Flanagan was a uh, uh, a staunch opponent of segregation. And uh, he opened up a, a boy's home uh, based on this philosophy. Um, so that became known as Boys Town and it opened in 1917. And Daniel Desdune was the first music teacher at Boys Town. Um, he, uh, he volunteered, he was an, a volunteer music teacher there. And he taught there for the rest of his life. Uh, three days a week, at least he went to Boys Town to uh, work with uh, the Father Flanagan Boys Home Band. And uh, he wrote um, comedy skits, skits and, and, and plays. Uh, the band ended up touring the nation to uh, earn funds uh, for, uh, for, for keeping Boys Town running. Um, so he did this, as I mentioned, for the rest of his life. Uh, April 20th, um, 1929, uh, the Father Flanagan Boys Home Orchestra had a performance at which Daniel Desdune mentioned to Father Flanagan that he was coming down with a slight cold. Um, and this, this turned out to be the early uh, symptoms of spinal meningitis. Um, so Daniel Desdune passed away four days later at the age of 56 in 1929. But he, uh, he left a huge legacy um, with, within Omaha and beyond it. Um, yeah, so, so what I found really interesting, um, and, and we had kind of talked about this, this tradition coming up from um, out of Louisiana, uh, because if you if you look at his his early band, he took over the military band and um, marching bands uh, in in New Orleans. Even now, uh, tend to be heavily uh, brass. I mean, you have you have some woodwinds, but the woodwinds tend to be more with the bands that are playing, you know, like inside. But when you're out, you know, marching around, uh, it's, it's usually a lot, of, a lot of brass. And so I'm looking at the, the kind of evolution of his band, his, the orchestration of it. So it was, he did take over the military band and you see that it's heavily brass. Uh, but then when he develops his own, um, Des Dune band, then you, you start to see the woodwinds coming in. So, um, I mean, and, and this is not a, a question that we can answer on this panel, but, you know, part of what we're doing is, is asking questions that people can think about. Uh, and, and as they're researching and thinking about how this music came to be. And so I'm just, uh, we had talked about uh, basically just the, the map of the United States and the, the, the routes that people were, pay, were taking, migrating to different parts of the country. So Destun was migrating up from Louisiana, which also we haven't really talked about, you know, his family's Haitian. So that's, that's where you get Destun instead of Daydun, which would be the French pronunciation. So there's another tradition that's even coming into this whole uh, musical genre. Um, 
but he's coming up from Louisiana with a certain kind of musical tradition that's developing out of New Orleans. And then you have other people that are coming up from, um, from up the Mississippi River that are coming, coming west. And so we have this place where Omaha kind of becomes this melting pot or this place where you can remix these different traditions because what we have coming up out of Mississippi would be the blues style. Um, and that's a different kind of orchestration than this brassy type music that's coming you know, out of, out of Louisiana. Um, so I'm just curious about how the role, I mean, you know, like as, as people are continue to think about and research what was happening in Omaha, this difference of orchestrations and how people are putting together bands and the sounds that they're creating based on these different traditions that are coming together. May I, may I interject? Yes. Just very quickly. Uh, but you made some wonderful observations about, and I was going to comment on brass and the evolution and the number of people in the band. But I wanted to say something for our audience to consider uh, that correlates with the story that has been told, told about Mr. Distan. And that is one, that this was all happening uh, in the post civil roar and during the reconstruction period in America where in the South, these things could even think about happening and the arts and the expansion of our uh, culture was happening while this was happening. And very important that this was, would have been impossible <laughs> uh, just a few years earlier than that. Uh, starting in about 1870, he was, so he was right in the midst of that, and that this railroad uh, comment you make, and the migration, uh, the mass migration that was happening from the South to the North in things, including music and musicians, was all going on at the same time. And then one more comment in the one slide that you had, where the newspaper was featuring him. It was in 1915, I believe, and we may have overlooked that, but this was the Monitor. It was one of our first African-American newspapers in Omaha, way before the 1938 Omaha Star. And here's the Monitor right here, and there he is, very interesting little side light, thank you. And to also add to that, uh, Professor Hurd, uh, another one of the direct predecessors, if we're speaking like musically, it, of jazz is ragtime. And that tradition uh, was really popular in Missouri, which is not too far south of where we are in Omaha, too. So along with the other traditions that were coming up from the deeper south, we also have um, the influence of ragtime as well. And, and, and I'm glad you, you brought that up because the song that I was playing as we were waiting for people to log in was actually a ragtime song that was written by Dan Destoon. Uh, and it's on YouTube, so you can find it. But yeah, so that's, that is a part of the tradition too. So all of this music is coming together uh, and, and it's coming together here. So let me go back to, all right. So here's another figure that uh, is important for us in Josiah Waddle. Um, yeah, so Josiah Waddle um, was born in 1849 in Springfield, Missouri. Um, he, was, he was born into slavery, um, but at the age of 14 in 1863, he escaped and he joined the 79th Regiment of the United States Army. Um, and he remained involved in uh, um, uh, Civil War um, fraternal societies uh, for the rest of his life. Um, he uh, moved to Nebraska City in 1877 and then Omaha in 1880, um, where he became uh, 
went into business as Nebraska's first black barber. Um, but he, uh, he uh, led a, a popular band uh, starting in 1902. Um, and he, uh, he had a couple of different um, really prominent bands. Um, so when I got to meet uh, Preston Sr. about 20 years ago and talk to him, he, one of the first things he told me, uh, uh, one of his, um, a fixture of his childhood was uh, Professor Waddle's All Ladies Band. Uh, so he, he, there it is, yep. And uh, Preston Sr. remembered seeing those at, at, at uh, church picnics and uh, it was a very popular band. Um, but uh, Professor Waddle also led a children's orchestra. Um, and uh, the legendary Omaha um, trombonist Elmer Cromley was part of that orchestra. Um, and he said that, uh, that Professor Waddle made sure these kids were paid pretty well. Um, that he remembered uh, one time uh, making uh, $12 at a gig. And he, uh, according to Elmer Crumley, the average working man's salary was around $15 a week at that time. And as a child, um, he was able to, to, to make that much money. Um, but yeah, he had uh, a lot of different um, uh, students who went on to be very successful. One of his students that he was most proud of, the WPA interviewed uh, Josiah Waddle a, a year before he died. He lived to be 89 years old. He died in 1939. They interviewed him in 1938, but he talked about Lloyd Hunter. Um, and we'll probably get to Lloyd Hunter a little bit later, but he was he led a, um, a very popular band out of Omaha. He was born in Omaha, uh, studied music from Josiah Waddle. He was inspired to become a musician by Waddle and Des Dune, um, and then led a, a very popular territory band that many legendary musicians played in in the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, so yeah, so I think it's really important to, to look at the ways that um, you know these two figures really open the door for the next generation. So it isn't just about them coming to Omaha and forming these bands, but it's also about them grooming the next generation of musicians. And these the, this next generation becomes very influential in grooming the, the generation that become what we know as jazz music musicians. Um, so you had mentioned and uh, Dan Destun uh, working with the Boys Town Band. So here's a picture of him in 1921. So I guess this was one of the early um, years. And this is, is later uh, 1928. And I, I told you, I really like this picture. And most of these pictures, by the way, I should say, come from Jesse's MA thesis. So like I said, his thesis is fantastic. Uh, but I really like this picture because the, the little boy playing the trumpet, he's so small, <laughs> but he's out in front and he's, and you, you can tell he's probably playing with all his heart. Um, but the, the thing for me in, in looking through these pictures and, and thinking about um, the training, because in your, in your thesis, one of the things that you talk about, or one of the themes is mentorship. And so I know we think about musicians um, now, you know, having big egos and being all about themselves, uh, but these musicians, musicians going all the way back to Des Dune, they were giving of themselves to teach the younger generation and, and to create a, a love for, for music. And it made me think as a child, uh, so if you weren't someone who was at Boys Town, uh, where would you hear music? You know, where would you see this and, and be an inspiration? So I looked at some of the pictures and I, was thinking, well, you wouldn't take a child into a dance hall uh, because you, you just wouldn't. <laughs> so they, they, they start fidgeting and they got to use the bathroom. But you would take a child to a parade. And considering the segregation, that would be a place more likely that a Black child would be able to have access. And I was also thinking about where they practice. So I didn't mention my own musical 
background, but I played the clarinet. I started playing uh, in sixth grade and I played all the way through college and I was part of a HBCU marching band. And if you know anything about black college bands, you know, that's a, that's a academic sport in and of itself, <laughs> you know? So um, I started thinking about when we were in high school, we would have to march around the neighborhood to get ready for a parade because you can't just play inside the band room and march for, I don't know, two or three miles. You pass out before you got halfway through the, the parade route. So these bands, his marching bands, they would have had to have gone outside to march around the community because you have to build that stamina to play and march. So I'm thinking that that even in practicing, he's building, they're building relationships within the community, but they're also inspiring children because the children see that and they hear that and they want to be a part of that when they're older. And so I'm kind of thinking about that when we see this younger generation that comes in. So you talked about some of these teenagers that were playing music. Uh, so we have the Jungle Rhythm Boys. Um, and so one of the, the older musicians that you talked to, or a couple of them are in this band, right? Uh, no, they, they learned from uh, a member of that band. Okay. Uh, he was one of their teachers, yeah. Okay. But yeah, yeah. so even in this picture, these, these young boys have made their instruments. So mm -hmm. this upright bass, I, I, I can't tell, but it looks like a metal garbage can or something, or a barrel that he has cut out and put strings on and basically has created a bass. So they're making instruments to play music, uh, but that inspiration is coming from seeing and hearing these professional musicians that are around like Des Dune and, and like Waddle's bands. Um, you had a story about uh, one of these teenagers that heard the song for the first time. Oh, um, yeah. I, so when I was doing this research, uh, yeah, I, um, so um, some of the people that helped me the most with this, uh, uh, you know, Luigi Waits brought, brought me into this really. Um, and he, uh, but he was in a band uh, when he was a teenager called the Cats of Rhythm. Um, and Von Richard Trimble is another person who spent zillions of hours helping me through this. Um, and Willie Davis also. Um, so they were the, all three of these guys were members of this band. Um, so one day we were sitting around, they were telling stories about the Cats of Rhythm. Um, and so they remembered a time, I think it was like 1942, so they would have been like 14, 15 years old. Um, the Cats of Rhythm played at the Dreamland Ballroom. And uh, e even as teenagers, these were, these were highly trained musicians, especially Von Richard. Von Richard was their um, lead arranger. Um, but they, they had an intermission from the dance and they went to a cafe. And they told me the story because when they're at the cafe, this new song came on the jukebox. It was just released like that day. And people were excited about it. And they thought it would be cool. They went back to the dance and played this brand new song. Um, and they were able to do this. But what blew me away was that um, Von Richard sat there in the cafe, heard the song one time, and scored on napkins what every single instrument was playing. Um, and then they got back to the Dreamland, and they just played it, sight read it. And so as a, I, I'm not a trained musician, so this just blew my mind. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember saying to them, like, how, how could you do this? And they, they said, well, it was easy. He wrote out all the notes for us. So we just played the notes. And but I said to Vaughn, how, I don't, he said, well, I could just, I could hear what the instruments are playing. It's easy. You just Write, write it down, but to me, it it, it sounded it sounded superhuman to me. I, I, I but uh, yeah, they were just teenagers when they did that. Wow! So having access to um, these famous musicians and they're, they're willing to take time to you know talk to 
these young people and groom them. Um, so I have this, um, this picture here and he's looking down so he doesn't know that it's uh, Professor Love. <laughs> Well, I wanted to give a little time for people to wake up from their faint. But, <laughs> uh, if you'll read the annotation, uh, this is circa uh, 1945. Uh, and it, that is me on the left, shaking hands with the legendary at that time. He was as big as uh, a black musician could be. He and Duke Ellington uh, shared uh, the stage in Black America as the biggest, most popular uh, Black orchestras. And my dad was playing lead sax in, for Count Basie at that time. And I think, I thought we were in Harlem at the time that I had a chance to have, take this picture. I had just got a haircut, by the way. And <laughs> But the photog but the annotation on the photograph says Detroit, Michigan. So I'm going to defer to that. But I surely remember interacting with Count Basie, uh, mainly in the New York area. Surely I remember that my mother would join my dad, and I that this is probably one of those times. But we were in Detroit, Michigan, at a diner. So that kind of provides us a little segue into talking about um, the access that people had to these famous musicians. So we're already, I think that everybody could kind of see that we're, the, the groups that we're talking about um, are what we would consider more orchestral groups right now. Um, you know, they have this kind of symphonic sound, smooth sound, uh, but they play a lot of different kinds of music, right, Jesse? So you have these territory bands. So tell us about the, the territory bands. Um, yes, yeah, so the, these bands, uh, they were playing, um, you know, it's important to note that, um, yeah, one of the first things Preston Sr. explained to me about these bands was, you know, they were playing dances, uh, not concerts. Like um, he said that, at this time, maybe Duke Ellington might play concerts, but everybody else just played dances and dances were a big social event at this time. Um, so you had the development of, uh, well, you had a couple of things come about in the 20s, uh, uh, improvements to highways and then uh, automobiles became affordable. Uh, so all of a sudden now you had this phenomenon where these bands could access audiences they couldn't access before. Um, so these bands began traveling and they could earn more money and more musicians got opportunities. And Omaha um, had many territory bands, but um, they had three territory bands that uh, most musicians and scholars agree were among the three very best territory bands in the nation. Um, these bands were you know, world-class. Uh, so the, the three that most people talk about are uh, Red Perkins Orchestra, um, Lloyd Hunter, and then Nat Tolls. Um, so, um, and the, these bands were based out of Omaha, that there's that Nat Tolls. And a lot of musicians that we now consider to be uh, legends, jazz legends, played in these orchestras. Um, Charlie Green um, from Omaha, who ended up working with Fletcher Henderson. Um, he played with Red Perkins early on, and, and he played with Fletcher Henderson, then Bessie Smith. Um, Joe Jones, Count Basie's drummer, uh, uh, played with Lloyd Hunter. Um, he came here from Alabama. Um, and uh, yeah, Charlie Christian, and actually the legendary guitar player ended up coming here. And uh, so it, it was, uh, Johnny Otis uh, said these bands were uh, kind of a, you know, a, a school that got you up to the big time. And Preston Love Sr. Um, refer to these bands kind of like in a baseball analogy. It's like if you wanted to play in the major leagues, you got to do triple A first. And he called Omaha the, the triple A of, of the music industry at this time. So um, that's essentially who those territory bands were. Uh, Nat Tolls is from New Orleans originally, by the way. Um, Red Perkins is from uh, uh, Muchakinak, Iowa, which isn't there anymore. 
and uh, Lloyd Hunter is from Omaha. And and so we have Preston Love Sr. playing with, with Nat Tolls. Uh, we have him right here. Um, one of the things that that's I think is is really interesting when we're talking about this, uh, and I think we have to go back to Daniel Gastoun for for a minute, because he, according to your research, he was very influential in bringing musicians to Omaha and keeping them here, and, and recruiting. So he was a big recruiter of musicians um, early on that he could you know, could groom and to make a part of his, his band, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that continued, and uh, these guys continued that tradition too of, of drawing these, uh, these excellent musicians uh, to Omaha. And, and one thing that, uh, and I, I didn't put the map in, but one thing that is, uh, I should pause to say here, is that if you look at the old uh, train maps, um, you could go from New York all the way out to San Francisco or Los Angeles by train, but in order to do that, you had to stop in Omaha. And so Omaha becomes this, this hub really because of, I mean, not only because of that, but it becomes this place where um, musicians are passing through as they're going back and forth from California to, to New York or Chicago. Um, and you were saying in your thesis that uh, Daniel Destoon, one of the things that he did because he, he developed a relationship with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, he was able to get musicians jobs. So he not only convinced them, you know, hey, you should stay here and you should be a part of our band or, or you know, one of the bands that's developing, but I can get you a job so that you can make money while you're, you're working and building up yourself. So I think that that's really a, a, a very important point to make, you know, that he was, he was making sure that people not only came here, but they were able to provide for themselves. Yeah. All right, so the Dreamland Ballroom. <laughs> Professor Love, you want to talk about the Dreamland? Uh, there probably won't be enough time left. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just say, uh, I, I just am enjoying this uh, webinar more than the audience because I, I, I live through it watching the evolution of the things that have been talked about of these territorial or regional bands and those personalities, those side men who went from one of those regionals to another because of whatever, a uh, little more pay, fell out with somebody, whatever. But uh, there was a development of a cadre of musicians that just started to accumulate that made Omaha what it was. And when my dad began his territorial band a little later in the sequence he had a his pick of the litter uh for from all of those guys but the there were some early pictures of this building from the inside uh, i think uh what's his name red uh, uh what's red perkins perkins his band was up on the stage in the Dreamland Ballroom. It needs to be said before we jump to the Dreamland that this brick building was built in 1923 by an African-American by the name of Jimmy Jewell. May I say, there weren't a lot of African-Americans who had the wherewithal to build a building, let alone a big giant two-story brick building like this. Jimmy Jewell uh, is a story in black history all by itself. By the way, the Dreamland Ballroom, the entry is right here, but it was the venue for every territorial and big bands. Uh, when they came to Omaha, that was the top. 
the Dreamland Ballroom. You might notice on the bottom, uh, on the left-hand side is a beauty parlor. And in that beauty shop was Barbara's and uh, his wife, uh, Versi. <laughs> she had a, but right there, it later became uh, McGee's Barbershop. And there's a, a barbershop right now in Omaha. It's called Young Bloods. And it's called Young Bloods because a little knuckleheaded barber, uh, who they ended up calling Young Blood, came into that barbershop and learned this thing. And now he's got the biggest, most busy barbershop up there on Ames. And then over here was Tuxedo uh, Billiard Hall, where we all learned to play pool. And for those of us who had enough nerve to play for some money, lost most of our money to the hustlers. But, and I would say one more thing, I could talk forever about the Dreamland, but on the far left, there used to be on that side of the building, uh, a fire stairway to go to the top. And uh, because of the heat and before air conditioning, during the summer, they would have to crack that door from the fire escape, if you will, to the ballroom. And my dad, underage as he was, used to sneak up those stairs and listen and take mental notes of all of his iconic places. And one day they busted him and opened that door and said, what you doing there, boy? And uh, he was shocked that they knew he was there. And he said, oh, I'm just listening. Oh my, and oh, I just love the music and so forth. And so well, do you play? He said, I, I play saxophone. Oh boy, you don't know how to play. Somebody go get me a saxophone, Count Basie said. And they went and got a saxophone and threw it up, gave it to my dad and they say, play something. And my dad knew their music, their book, if you will, so well, he played one of their songs from start to finish, like a pro, they could not believe it. And they said, wow. And the end of the story is, Less than six months later, the lead uh, saxophone player uh, for Count Basie took grave ill and they, Count Basie, uh, were on their way to a very important tour and they couldn't figure out what they were gonna do because the lead saxophone is critical. And they say, what about that boy down there in Omaha, Nebraska? And they called my dad and pulled him up to New York. He jumped, he leapfrogged the territory bands and went from Omaha, Nebraska to 24th street and all the way to the top of the heap. And that's why my dad was such an iconic person in music and in Omaha for all those years, by the way, that was, that happened in 1942. I think that's a really, really good story because it, it shows how the musicians in Omaha not only were able to to groom and identify young talent, but were able to also pull them in. So I know Jesse, you were saying you were telling me about uh, some of the musicians who got an opportunity to, to play because of World War II. So you want to tell a couple of the, tell that story? Oh, um, yeah, uh, that was. I, for for Luigi, those were some of his first opportunities to drum for some of these territory bands because uh, the draft had taken so many people away. Uh, but it was it was a big opportunity for for Von Richard Trimble. Um, so uh, Von Richard uh, it grew up in a, his house is known uh, as the Broadview Hotel, sometimes or the Trimble Castle. Um, it was uh, it's on um, uh, I believe Florence. Um, but it's it's a big beautiful home still there, um, and that's that's where the black orchestras who came to perform in Omaha would stay um, because they couldn't stay at the hotels. So uh, Vaughn got an opportunity. Uh, he was really proud of the fact he had this autograph book, and he got his autograph book not by going to these uh, dances, but by just walking down the hall and <laughs> having people staying in his home sign it. So he uh, knew Duke Ellington uh, because of that. And in 1944, uh, the draft had sufficiently depleted uh, Duke Ellington's orchestra. Um, and he sent for Von Richard Trimble to come join his, his group. And Von was just 16 years old at the time, uh, but he got to go on tour as a trumpet player for Duke Ellington. 
Now that that is an amazing story in and of itself, but you hit on another story that's that's interesting too that we we want to get to, and that's talking about the effect of segregation, because uh, these these territory bands and the bands that were playing in Omaha, a lot of the performances of the early bands were not in front of black audiences, right? Yeah, yeah, they were they were playing a lot of times dances and and. Uh... In, in white communities uh, and playing polkas and waltzes and um, and traveling, um, so yeah, they would they could play for they play for black audiences in places like Omaha or maybe Des Moines, uh, but they played well. Um, the Honey Creek, Iowa, is, is the title of Preston Love's autobiography, or Manhattan, Kansas, Norfolk, Nebraska. Um, they were you know, on you know playing as many dances as they could to maximize their income. So, um, so there were limited opportunities for these, particularly the early orchestras to play in front of uh, all black audiences, unless they were playing it. And that's the reason why I, I keep going back to the, the marching band, because I feel like that was a way for the, the band to actually be out in the community and play, perform their music for the community. Uh, by by doing this 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 marching band, but there were also the picnics that allowed them to be a part of the, the black community. But um, I want to go back to Trumbull Mansion because I think that's really really significant. Uh, Professor Love had mentioned when we were talking earlier about the Green Book, and uh, for those that, that don't know, the Green Book was basically this book that was put together uh, during Jim Crow, where it would tell black people. If you're traveling, these are places where you can actually stay because they couldn't stay everywhere. But Von Trumbull, his parent, his father bought this huge house, and that house was on in the Green Book, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Listed. It was listed uh, as the Broadview Hotel, and there's one other name that's listed under. But yeah, it appears in the Green Book. As and a, so, and so, I think that's really significant that you would have these big time musicians would actually stay in his home. So he grew up, like you said, Duke Ellington was down the hall. Can you imagine being a kid? I mean, and, and you're playing music and you're kind of getting to the age where it's like, yeah, music means something to me. It's not like there's this man and he plays music, but it's like, I play music now. And this band is big time and he's down the hall. I mean, how exciting is that? You know, so just having that kind of access. Yeah, Professor Love. May, may I mention just really quickly, uh, but that whole Green Book was both formal and informal because these musicians, especially the territorial, they traveled uh, the rural roads to go from gig to gig uh, and they, but they didn't, they couldn't stay, quite frankly, in many cases could not bag, buy gas. Uh, they just had trouble on the road because if it would break down, you know, they just were faced with racism uh, for the whole thing. But when they did get to the cities, uh, there were the informal was uh, that uh, down the road was a house, it might not have been in the green book, but we knew that that's where uh, Sally Jones or Mr. Jones lived. You go, you could stay there. They would be like breakfast, and, you know, bread and breakfast is the way we think of it now. They get some soul food and a good place to sleep. But then they had the, the, the ones that were bigger and could accommodate big, big ones uh, were in the green book. And it was a major part. I would, I hate to do this, but I'll tell you real quickly. My dad went at his point of having a territorial band, had a saxophone player that played in his band and his name was Eli Wolinski. He was Jewish and that, and one of his jobs beside playing the saxophone was when they got to town, they'd send them into the hotel, motel to get nine rooms. He'd go in there and be white as he was. He got the keys and said, good night, see you in the morning. And then as soon as they drove around the corner and then all them, Black musicians going running out of that beer, going to run in those rooms. They pulled that off many, many times. 
And Jesse, you had a quite you had a, a a story about the musicians that were able that came through that got into the Fontenelle Hotel. Oh yeah, there the, there was that story. Um, yeah, and and yeah, and to Professor Love's point there. Um, uh, before I get to that, um, one thing I heard from so many musicians was how important it was if you're going to be the leader of a territory band uh, to know how to fix a bus. Uh, so apparently, like Lloyd Hunter, uh, you know, no matter what would break down, he could fix it instantly because you couldn't count on being in a town uh, and, and, and having somebody help you like that. So uh, you had to have a wide variety of skills to be a, you know, a, a, territory, a black territory band leader to um, to the point that Professor Love was making. But um, yeah, there was a story that I heard from so many uh, of these older musicians. They, they didn't know, nobody knew the name of the band, uh, but everybody knew this, this story. And uh, the story was that sometime in the early 1930s, um, a, a black band came to play in Omaha and they walked right into the Fontenelle Hotel uh, where they wouldn't have been allowed to stay, um, but they, they had a plan. Um, and then when they got into the lobby, they uh, were apparently um, talking to each other in gibberish. And one guy from the band went up to the desk and yelled something out loudly in gibberish. And the guy next to him uh, faked an accent and pretended to be his translator and explained that they were businessmen from Africa here to do business and they needed rooms, um, which they were apparently promptly given rooms. And then uh, uh, everybody had a big laugh at the dance that night when they announced how they were able to get rooms at the Fontenelle Hotel. Um, so I, I included that story in the thesis, but don't know which it was. <laughs> really quick, uh, one of the things you said, but I want to make sure we let people know, most of the uh, the travels and the gigs that my dad played as a territorial band was for, they were dances for white audience. They were not going from black ballroom to that. They were, for, and so they were treated like uh, Negroes who performed for white people and that they played, you know, they didn't play James Brown. They played the dance music of the times from uh, some of the white, the songs and the people loved them but they were absolutely had to stay in their place. All right, so moving on, uh, I'm bringing this picture up and this is uh, Justin's, Justin's uh, what great, 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 great. grandfather. Mm -hmm. And then that's my great grandfather uh, next to him, his son. Okay, so <clears throat> he owned, so this is the first black owned barbershop in Omaha. Dad. Yes, and there's actually a family joke really quick. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to my uncle yesterday and uh, P Professor Love mentioned a McGee's barbershop that was underneath the Dreamland Ballroom. And so my uncle was actually married to Mr. McGee's daughter. And she, they used to have arguments about whose barbershop was the first black owned barbershop in <laughs> Omaha. And the joke was that um, Mr. McGee's barbershop was the first black barbershop in the North Omaha area. And that my great great grandfather's barbershop was the first in Omaha period. <laughs> so I bring him up because of this next slide. So we have Jesse Pluke Simmons, who's the saxophonist. And what's his relationship to the people in the previous picture? That is the brother of Albin, who is the son. So he is one of the two sons of, of uh, Alexander Simmons. Okay. So and, and, and I thought that this was really good point to bring out because we think about the, the nature of, you know, being a musician as a profession, mm -hmm. uh, it can be very precarious. So uh, if we start thinking about also maybe the, uh, some class dynamics. So Absolutely. Jesse was able to pursue his, his passion uh, and his talent for music uh, but he was able to do that because his father had already laid, was laying the foundation with this barbershop. So the father had a steady income that allowed him that ability to, you know, to pursue that, that dream. Because, you know, if you're in a, a, a family that 
is barely scraping by. Everybody needs to have a regular job. Right. So you can gig on the side or whatever, but you got to do that nine to five. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, it's, it, it's interesting the way that um, class also works in this, right? Because especially with the early orchestras, a lot of them were classically trained. Mm-hmm. Um, so that meant that their, their families had the money to pay for them to get a formal music education. Uh, but as time goes on, you have some people that are able to, to learn. So uh, Jesse, you, you talked about, uh, was it Luigi that was self-taught initially? Initially. Right. Uh, yeah, he got a formal education a little later on. Right, but he, he came from a background that didn't allow him to get that early formal music education like others did. So he was self-taught, but then again, that mentoring tradition, somebody recognized his talent and, you know, formally trained him. Yep. Yeah. And then after, after he got out of the army in, in uh, World War II, he studied at the Midwest Conservatory of Music in Chicago. Um, uh, um, he used the GI Bill to do that. Okay. Um, but yeah, like Basie Givens and, and Cliff Dudley and, and Dick Lewis, these are some of the older musicians that he he, he essentially considered them like his fathers, um, like his musical fathers. And um, they, they, they taught him a lot. But yeah, so it's, it's really interesting that, um, that we have, so Jesse is a part of the Red Perkins band, which becomes one of this, this influential next generation of big bands, right, in Omaha. Um, so they're recording music, right? Um, Justin, do you know anything else about uh, Jesse's um, involvement with with the Red Perkins band? Um, I don't, but I will say though, you know, sometimes different gifts miss uh, different generations, and we kind of talked about this yesterday um, or the other day when we had our meeting. But um, as you can see, he has three instruments in front of him. He has two saxophones and the clarinet, and so there, you know, that's like an immersive type of training, you know, where you have to be focused and so focused to the point that you can learn the technique on all those instruments. And so um, I think it missed my great, my great grandfather, but it did go to my grandmother who was a vocalist and she was a mediocre pianist, but um, you know, talk about immersion in the culture. Um, When we visited our house and I said this on the last uh, webinar, you know, music was a big part of just our culture, even before I had formal lessons, it was almost something to be proud of because when you speak about having money coming out of this uh, particular period or coming into this period, a sign that you had money was that you had a piano in your house because the music that was being put out um, you know, was being put out via sheet music because, you know, certain things weren't available yet for people to like listen to. And so you had the sheet music so you could read it. And that's how you had um, access to music. And so my grandmother had a piano in the house and she had an organ in the house. And, you know, she would play, she would teach us how to play, but she also taught us harmonies, intense harmonies, and to learn how to balance your part and be able to perform in an ensemble. And that also goes back to uh, Jesse Otto's point about uh, the musician being able to, um, you know, write out the notes after hearing it one time, being so fully immersed and having just that daily um, exposure to, you know, to music so that it just becomes second nature. And, you know, the more you have it or the more you have that exposure, the easier it is to just, you know, to be a solid musician. Right, right. Yep. So, um, Let's see if we have any questions. I don't see any. A lot of compliments for the panel. Um, <laughs> Professor Love, you, you got a couple of comments that you were so cute <laughs> as a little boy. <laughs> um, yeah, so. I just, I'm really taken by the level of um, camaraderie, I, I guess I would say, of older musicians taking on younger musicians. And I know, Jesse, you were saying uh, 
people would say that if they were recruited by Dan Destoon, they that that was like that was just the the best thing ever to be recruited by him. Like you want me to play for you, uh, and so seeing the the way that um, people were willing to take on younger artists, younger musicians to, to kind of teach them the craft. But then I think that um, it also, when we're talking about how jazz developed, it, it, it's also about integrating these new forms or these new ways of playing into what's already existing. Um, we talked yesterday about people playing the polkas and waltzes, you know, and I'm just curious if 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 you sat down and actually started listening to some of the music and you start peeling away some of the layers, will you not find some of that in there? I mean, because you got to play what you know. So I, I'm sure you start peeling away some of the layers. Some of the stuff that's innovative is like, you put, put a riff on a little polka tune or, you know, a little uh, something else, a little waltz, you add something to it. Uh, because that's really what they were talking about when they were talking about this dude, right? That he was, he was swinging. Like he was, he had the regular orchestral sound, but then added a little something to it. And that's that ingenuity or that improvisation improvisation is what we consider to be jazz, right? So looking at that, I think is, is uh, just another way of thinking about it. Um, let's see, someone asked, are there recordings available for some of the traveling bands? Does anybody know? Yeah, I, I, uh, I was able to assemble, um, uh, I, I was able, to, there's an appendix to my thesis and it, it's an audio appendix, and it was I, I was able to assemble all the all the known recordings made by black orchestras from Omaha before 1950. Um, there's uh, yeah four wonderful recordings from Red Perkins, um, and uh, uh, while I'm on that, uh, to uh, Justin's point there about Pluke Simmons and the multiple instruments, uh, Red Perkins um, at this point only hired musicians who were proficient on multiple instruments. Um, so there were two reasons for this. He could make his orchestra sound like a much bigger orchestra that way. Um, it, but also, if you listen to the recordings, that's evident. But it was also, a, it was a visual gimmick that, um, that, you know, these guys could play a wide variety of instruments and switch around. Um, but yeah, Lloyd Hunter's orchestra recorded about the same time. Uh, Lloyd Hunter recorded in New York City um, and uh, Red Perkins recorded in, uh, in Indiana. Um, I, I found uh, uh, Gary Foster, Preston Sr.'s longtime drummer, had uh, uh, recordings of the Nat Tolls Orchestra. Um, so I, I was able to find quite a bit. And yeah, and these were these were amazing bands, the recording sound. Also, uh, Luigi had, uh, uh, he had bought recording equipment. So he would record his bands like in the 40s and 50s. And, um, and he'd save these recordings and uh, uh, we, uh, um, my best friend is an audio engineer and he remastered them. So um, these recordings that Luigi made uh, ended up in there too. So there's about, I think I can't remember, there's like 20 some tracks I was able to assemble for the audio appendix. So, yeah, so there's one more visual that we have of Preston Love Sr. with Lena Horn in one of these uh, big band type settings. Yes, yes. My dad played uh, in so many eras. He played in the big band era. And I could, if, I, if there were more time, I could tell you about each era he played in, but he was the West Coast music director for Motown in his upper age. Uh, and he played behind and with every major Motown. And see this guy standing up there directing. He did that and played the saxophone. He knew all of the things. And, and 
I could go on and on, but the one story I'll leave you with is when my, I was of course much older than, uh, at the time and up doing my life, but my brothers and sisters, when they would come home from school, uh, Smokey Robinson was sitting at my kitchen table playing cards with my mother and uh, uh, someone like uh, Marvin Gaye was snoring on the couch. And so that's the, what they grew up with. And by the way, Smokey Robinson cheated in cards. <laughs> All right, uh, someone asked, are there copies of the audio recordings along with the thesis? So the, um, the, if you're able to download the, um, the thesis, the recordings are appendices. So it's a zip file that's attached that you can download and, um, and then get it from there. All right. So I want to thank everyone. We've reached the end of our time. Um, and this has been a wonderful discussion. We could, we could keep this going, but we can't. It's 7.15. We got, we got to end it. <laughs> but I want to thank uh, all of you for being here. Uh, Professor Otto, Professor Payne, Professor Love for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. This was so great, so fascinating. Um, I want to invite all of you to our next webinar, which is next Thursday, uh, where we'll be celebrating again. So we're celebrating all through to the end of the school year. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Quincy Mills, uh, Dispatches from the Barber's Chair, Black Barbershops, Black Studies, and the Democratic Ideals of Community. So it's going to be a really fascinating uh, discussion about the role of the the barbershop in the Black community. But we want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Uh, we want everyone to stay well. Uh, the recording will be up either tomorrow or, or at least by Monday. So if you want to see it again, make sure that you tell your friends that they missed it. <laughs> and we want to thank you and please come again. Good night.